Columbine High School Massacre from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. The Columbine High School Massacre was a school shooting that occurred on April 20th, 1999 at Columbine High School in Columbine, Colorado, the United States. The perpetrators, 12th grade senior students Eric Harris and Dylan Claybold, murdered 12 students and one teacher. Ten students were killed in the library, where the pair subsequently committed suicide. At the time, it was the deadliest shooting at a high school in the United States history. The crime has inspired several copycats, and Columbine has become a byword for a school shooting. The two perpetrators injured 21 additional people with gunshots and also exchanged gunfire with the police. Another three people were injured trying to escape the school. In addition to the shootings, the attack involved several homemade bombs. The largest of these were placed in the cafeteria. Car bombs were also placed in the parking lot and at another location that was intended to divert first responders. The motive remains unclear, but the pair planned the crime for about a year and wished for the massacre to rival the Oklahoma City bombing and cause the most deaths in the United States history. USA Today referred to the attack as planned as a grand, if badly implemented, terrorist bombing. The police were slow to enter the school, and they were heavily criticized for not intervening during the shooting. The incident resulted in the introduction of the immediate action rapid development tactic, which is used in situations where an active shooter is trying to kill people rather than take hostages. Columbine also resulted in an increased emphasis on school security with zero tolerance policies. Debates were sparked over gun control laws and gun culture, high school cliques, subcultures, and bullying. Also discussed were the moral panic over goths, social outcasts, the use of pharmaceutical antidepressants by teenagers, teenage internet use, and violence in video games. Section 1. Background. In 1996, 15-year-old Eric Harris created a private website on America Online, AOL. It was initially to host levels, WADs, Harris created for use in the first-person shooter video games Doom and Doom 2, as well as Quake. On the site, Harris began a blog, which included jokes and his thoughts on parents, school, and friends. It also detailed Harris sneaking out of the house to cause mischief and vandalism, such as lighting fireworks with his friend Dylan Claybold and others. The mascot of Columbine High School, CHS, is the Rebels, and he called these Rebel Missions. Harris and Claybold adopted the nicknames Reb and Vodka, respectively. Beginning in early 1997, the blog postings began to show the first signs of Harris's anger against society. By the end of the year, the site contained instructions on how to make explosives. Harris wrote, The first true pipe bombs created entirely from scratch by the rebels, Reb and Vodka. Now, our only problem is to find the place that will be ground zero. Harris's site attracted few visitors and caused no concern until March 1998. Harris ended a blog post detailing murderous fantasies with, all I want to do is kill and injure as many of you as I can, especially a few people, like Brooks Brown, a classmate of his. Brown claims Claybold gave him the web address in an effort to warn him of Harris's threats of violence against him. Others suggest it was in fact discovered by Brooks' brother, Aaron Brown, in 1997. After Brown's parents viewed the site, they contacted the Jefferson County Hereafter Jeffco Sheriff's Office. When investigator Michael Guerra accessed the website, he discovered numerous violent threats directed against the students and teachers of CHS. Guerra wrote a draft affidavit requesting a search warrant of the Harris household. The affidavit also mentioned the discovery of an exploded pipe bomb in February 1998 and a suspicion of Harris being involved in the unsolved case. The affidavit was never filed. Section 1.2 Van Incident on January 30, 1998, Harris and Claybold broke into a van that was parked near Littleton and stole tools and computer equipment. Shortly afterwards, they were arrested by a police officer and subsequently attended a joint court hearing, where they pled guilty to the felony theft. The judge sentenced them to a juvenile diversion program. 
As a result, both delinquents attended mandatory classes such as anger management and talked with diversion officers. Harris also began therapy with a psychologist and was prescribed antidepressants by a psychiatrist. They both were eventually released from diversion several weeks early because of positive actions in the program and put on probation. Harris continued his scheduled meetings with his psychologist until a few months before the massacre. Nearly a year before the massacre, Claybold wrote a message in Harris's 1998 yearbook, Killing enemies, blowing up stuff, killing cops. My wrath for January's incident will be godlike, not to mention our revenge in the commons. The commons was another term for the school cafeteria. Section 1.3, Journals. Harris and Claybold kept journals, which were released to the public in 2006. In the journals, the pair would eventually document their arsenal and plan of attack. Shortly after the court hearing for the van break-in, Harris reverted his website back to just posting user-created levels of doom. He began to write his thoughts down in a journal instead. It shows a long period of methodical preparation for the massacre. Harris even wrote on his computer about escaping to a foreign country after the attack, or hijacking an aircraft at Denver International Airport and crashing it into New York City. Claybold had already been writing down his thoughts since March 1997. As early as November 1997, Claybold mentioned going on a killing spree. Section 1.4, Schoolwork. Harris and Claybold also used their schoolwork to foreshadow the massacre. They both displayed themes of violence in their creative writing projects. Harris wrote a paper on school shootings and a poem from the perspective of a bullet. Claybold wrote a short story about a man killing students which worried his teacher so much that she alerted his parents. Both had actively researched war and murder. For one project, Harris wrote a paper on the Nazis and Claybold wrote a paper on Charles Manson. In a psychology class, Harris wrote he dreamed of going on a shooting spree with Claybold. Harris's journals described several experimental bomb detonations. Section 1.5 Tapes Harris and Claybold were both enrolled in video production classes and kept five videotapes that were recorded with school video equipment. Only two of these, Hitman for Hire and Rampart Range, and part of a third have been released. The remaining three tapes detail their plans and reasons for the massacre, including the ways they hid their weapons and deceived their parents. Most were shot in the Harris family basement and are known as the basement tapes. Thirty minutes before the attack, they made a final video saying goodbye and apologizing to their friends and families. In December 1999, before anybody else had seen them, Time Magazine published an article on these tapes. The victim's family members threatened to sue Jeffco. As a result, select victim families and journalists were allowed to see them, and they were then kept from the public indefinitely for fear of inspiring future massacres. The tapes have since been destroyed. There are only transcripts of some of the dialogue and a short clip recorded surreptitiously from a victim's father. The pair claimed they were going to make copies of the tapes to send to news stations, but never did so. When an economics class had Harris make an ad for a business, he and Claybold made a video called Hitmen for Hire on December 8, 1998, which was released in February 2004. It depicts them as part of the trench coat mafia, a clique in the school who wore black trench coats, extorting money for protecting preps from bullies. They were apparently not a part of the trench coat mafia, but were friends with some of its members. They wore black trench coats on the day of the massacre, and the video seemed a kind of dress rehearsal, showing them walking the halls of the school and shooting bullies outside with fake guns. On October 21, 2003, a video was released showing the pair doing target practice on March 6, 1999, in nearby foothills known as Rampart Range, with the weapons they would use in the massacre. In the early morning hours before the massacre, Harris left a microcassette labeled Nixon on the kitchen table. On it, Harris said, It is less than nine hours now, placing the recording at some time around 2.30 a.m. He went on to say, People will die because of me, and it will be a day that will be remembered forever. Section 2. Weaponry Section 2.1. Guns In the months prior to the attacks, 
Harris and Claybold acquired two 9mm firearms and two 12-gauge shotguns. Harris had a high point 995 carbine with 13 10-round magazines and a Savage Springfield 67H pump-action shotgun. Claybald used a 9x19mm Intratech Tech 9 semi-automatic handgun with one 52-round, one 32-round, and one 28-round magazine and a Stevens 311D double-barreled shotgun. Harris's shotgun was sawed off to around 26 inches, or .66 meters, and Claybald shortened his shotgun's length to 23 inches, or 0.58 meters, a felony under the National Firearms Act. Section 2.1.1 Tanner Gun Show On November 22, 1998, their friend Bobbin Anderson had purchased the carbine rifle and the two shotguns for the pair at the Tanner Gun Show, as they were too young to legally purchase the guns themselves. After the attack, she told investigators that she had believed the pair wanted the items for target shooting and that she had no prior knowledge of their plans. Anderson was not charged. Three days before the shooting, Claybold attended the high school prom with Anderson. Section 2.1.2 Mark Maines and Phil Duran. Harris and Claybald both held part-time jobs at the local Blackjack Pizza. Through Philip Duran, a co-worker, Claybald bought a Tech 9 handgun from Mark Maines for $500 at another gun show on January 23rd. Maines, Maines' girlfriend, and Duran are all in the Rampart Range video. After the massacre, Maines and Duran were both prosecuted. Each was charged with supplying a handgun to a minor and possession of a sawed-off shotgun. Maines and Duran were sentenced to a total of six years and four and a half years in prison, respectively. Section 2.2 .2, Explosives In addition to the firearms, the complex and highly planned attack involved several improvised explosive devices. Using instructions obtained via the internet and the anarchist cookbook, Claybald and Harris constructed a total of 99 bombs. These included pipe bombs, carbon dioxide cartridges filled with gunpowder called crickets, Molotov cocktails, propane tanks converted to bombs, car bombs, and diversionary bombs. For ignition, they used kitchen matches and model rocket igniters, as well as timing devices built from clocks and batteries for the propane, car, and diversion bombs. During the massacre, they carried lighters as well as match strikers taped to their forearms to light the pipe bombs and crickets. They had 45 crickets, 8 of which detonated, and 9 Molotov cocktails, 2 of which functioned. Harris also attempted to make napalm and envisioned a kind of backpack and flamethrower. They both attempted to get another friend and co-worker, Chris Morris, who was part of the Trenchcoat Mafia, to keep the napalm at his house, but he refused. Harris also tried to recruit him to be a third shooter, but would play it off as a joke when rebuked. Section 2.2.1 Pipe Bombs Harris's website contained instructions on making pipe bombs, including use of shrapnel. Harris's parents once discovered one of his pipe bombs. Harris's journal logged the creation of 25 pipe bombs. A total of 35 were used during the massacre, 14 of which detonated. Claybold scared his co-workers by once bringing a pipe bomb into work. They would give names to their pipe bombs. After the massacre, two pipe bombs had been left in Claybold's bedroom, one named Vengeance and another Atlanta, presumably after the Olympic Park bombing. Section 2.2.2 .2 Propane Bombs They had eight propane tanks used for bombs. The weekend before the shootings, Harris and Claybold bought two propane tanks and other supplies from a hardware store for a few hundred dollars. They bought six propane tanks on the morning of the attack. Harris was caught on a Texaco gas station security camera at 9.12 a.m. buying a Blue Rhino propane tank. Each cafeteria bomb was made from one 20-pound or 9.1-kilogram tank with a gallon gas can attached. Section 2.2.3 car bombs. Each car bomb was made from pipe bombs and two 20-pound propane tanks, with gas cans and bottles set throughout. Eight pipe bombs were used in Claybold's car, and one in Harris's. Section 2.3 Knives Claybold and Harris each carried two knives, which were never used during the massacre. 
Harris had one in a sheath taped to his ankle. Claybald had one that was a showpiece. It had a curved blade and several spikes on its handle. Part 3. The Massacre According to their journals and videos, the pair hoped that after detonating their homemade explosives in the cafeteria at the busiest lunch hour, killing hundreds of students, they would shoot, stab, and toss bombs at survivors fleeing from the school. Then, as police vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks, and reporters came to the school, bombs set in the boys' car would detonate, killing these emergency and other personnel. This did not happen, since the bombs in the cafeteria and the cars failed to detonate. Several other sources claim they planned to shoot the fleeing survivors from the parking lot, but moved to the staircase on a hill at the west side of the school when the bombs failed. Others claim the top of the staircase where the massacre began was their preferred spot to wait for the bombs to go off. Section 3.1 Planting the Bombs On Tuesday morning, April 20th, 1999, Harris and Claybald placed two duffel bags in the cafeteria. Each bag contained propane bombs, which were set to detonate at 11.17 a.m. during the A lunch shift. No witness recalled seeing the duffel bags being added to the 400 or so backpacks that were already in the cafeteria. The security staff at Columbine High School did not observe the bags being placed in the cafeteria. A custodian was replacing the school security videotape at around 11.14 a.m., which may have been the time that the duffel bags were dropped off. Some internet sleuths claimed that the bomb placement can be seen on the surveillance video at around 10.58 a.m. Shortly after the massacre, police also investigated whether the bombs were placed during the after-prom party held the prior weekend. Jefferson County Sheriff's Deputy Neil Gardner was assigned to the high school as a full-time school resource officer. Gardner usually ate lunch with the students in the cafeteria, but on April 20th, he was eating lunch in his patrol car at the northwest corner of campus watching students in the smoker's pit in Clement Park, a meadow adjacent to the school. Two backpacks filled with pipe bombs Aerosol containers and small propane bombs were also placed in a field about 3 miles or 4.8 kilometers south of Columbine High School and 2 miles or 3.2 kilometers south of the fire station. Set to detonate at 11.14 a.m., the bombs were intended as a diversion to draw firefighters and emergency personnel away from the school. Only the pipe bombs and one of the aerosol containers detonated, causing a small fire which was quickly extinguished by the fire department. Bomb technicians immediately examined the bombs and relayed to the police at the school the possibility of devices with motion activators. Around 11.10 a.m., Harris and Claybold arrived separately at Columbine High School. Harris parked his vehicle in the junior student parking lot and Claybold parked in the adjoining senior student parking lot. The school cafeteria was their primary bomb target. The cafeteria had long, outside, window-wall, ground-level doors and was just north of the senior parking lot. The library was located above the cafeteria in the second story of the window wall. Each car contained bombs timed to detonate at 12 o'clock p.m. As Harris pulled into the parking lot, he encountered classmate Brooks Brown, with whom he had recently patched up a long-standing series of disputes. According to Brown, who was smoking a cigarette, he was surprised to see Harris, whom earlier he noted had been absent from the class test. Harris seemed unconcerned, commenting, It doesn't matter anymore. Harris went on, Brooks, I like you now. Get out of here. Go home. Brown, feeling uneasy and already prepared to skip his next class, walked away. Several minutes later, students departing Columbine for their lunch break observed Brown heading down South Pierce Street away from the school. Meanwhile, Harris and Claybold armed themselves using straps and webbing to conceal weapons beneath black trench coats. They lugged backpacks and duffel bags that were filled with pipe bombs and ammunition. Harris also had his shotgun in one of his bags. Beneath the trench coats, 
Harris wore a homemade bandolier and a white t-shirt that read Natural Selection in black letters. Claybald wore a black t-shirt that read Wrath in red letters. The cafeteria bombs failed to detonate. Had these bombs exploded with full power, they could have killed or severely wounded all 488 students in the cafeteria and possibly made the ceiling collapse by destroying the pillars holding it up, dropping the library into the cafeteria. Section 3.2, 11.19 a.m., shooting begins. At 11.19 a.m., 17-year-old Rachel Scott and her friend Richard Castaldo were having lunch and sitting on the grass next to the west entrance of the school. Claybold threw a pipe bomb towards the parking lot, the bomb only partially detonated. Thinking that the pipe bomb was no more than a crude senior prank, Castaldo didn't take it seriously. Several students who were inside the school during the incident first thought that they were watching a prank. A witness reported hearing, Go! Go! before Claybold and Harris pulled their guns from beneath their trench coats and began shooting at Castaldo and Scott. Scott was killed instantly when she was hit four times with rounds fired from Harris's carbine. One shot was to the left temple. Castaldo was shot eight times in the chest, arm, and abdomen. He fell unconscious to the ground and was left paralyzed below the chest. Harris aimed his carbine down the west staircase in the direction of three students, Daniel Rohrbaugh, Sean Graves, and Lance Kirkland. The students were about to walk up the staircase directly below the shooters. All three were shot, and Rohrbaugh was killed. Dave Sanders, a teacher and coach at the school, was in the cafeteria when he heard the gunfire and began warning students. The shooters turned and began firing west in the direction of five students sitting on the grassy hillside adjacent to the steps and opposite the west entrance of the school. Michael Johnson was hit in the face, leg, and arm, but ran and escaped. Mark Taylor was shot in the chest, arms, and leg and fell to the ground, where he faked death. The other three escaped uninjured. Claybold walked down the steps toward the cafeteria. He came up to Lance Kirkland, who was already wounded and lying on the ground, weakly calling for help. Claybold said, Sure, I'll help you then shot Kirkland in the face with his shotgun, critically wounding him. Graves, paralyzed beneath the waist, had crawled into the doorway of the cafeteria's west entrance and collapsed. He rubbed blood on his face and played dead. After shooting Kirkland, Claybold walked towards the cafeteria door. He then stepped over the injured Graves to enter the cafeteria. Graves remembers Claybold saying, Sorry, dude. Claybold only slightly entered the cafeteria and did not shoot at the several people still inside. Officials speculated that Claybold went to check on the propane bombs. Harris was still on top of the stairs shooting and severely wounded and partially paralyzed 17-year-old Anne-Marie Hawkhalter as she tried to flee. Claybold came out of the cafeteria and went back up the stairs to join Harris. They shot at students standing close to a soccer field but did not hit anyone. They walked toward the west entrance, throwing pipe bombs in several directions, including onto the roof, only a few of which detonated. Witnesses heard one of them say, This is what we always wanted to do. This is awesome. Meanwhile, art teacher Patty Nielsen was inside the school. She had noticed the commotion and walked toward the west entrance with student Brian Anderson. Nielsen had intended to walk outside to tell the two students to knock it off, thinking they were either filming a video or pulling a student prank. As Anderson opened the first set of double doors, the gunman shot out the windows, injuring him with flying glass. Nielsen was hit in the shoulder with shrapnel. Anderson and Nielsen ran back down the hall into the library, and Nielsen alerted the students inside of the danger, telling them to get under desks and keep silent. She dialed 911 and hid under the library's administrative counter. Anderson fell to the floor bleeding from his injuries, then hid inside the magazine room adjacent to the library. Section 3.3 11.22 a.m. Police Response Harris had removed his trench coat. At 11.22 a.m., 
the custodian called Deputy Neil Gardner, the assigned resource officer to Columbine, on the school radio requesting assistance in the senior parking lot. The only paved route took him around the school to the east and south on Pierce Street, where at 11.23 a.m., he heard on his police radio that a female was down and assumed she had been struck by a car. While exiting his patrol car in the senior lot at 11.24 a.m., he heard another call on the school radio. Neil, there's a shooter in the school. Harris, at the west entrance, immediately turned and fired 10 shots from his carbine at Gardner, who was 60 yards away. As Harris reloaded his carbine, Gardner leaned over the top of his car and fired four rounds at Harris from his service pistol. Harris ducked back behind the building, and Gardner momentarily believed that he had hit him. Harris then re-emerged and fired at least four more rounds at Gardner, which missed and struck two parked cars before re-entering the building. No one was hit during the exchange of gunfire. Gardner reported on his police radio, quote, Shots in the building. I need someone in the south lot with me. By this point, Harris had shot 47 times and clayballed just five. The shooters then re-entered the school through the west entrance, moving along the main hallway, throwing pipe bombs and shooting at anyone they encountered. Clayballed shot Stephanie Munson in the ankle. She was able to walk out of the school. The pair then shot out the windows at the east entrance of the school. After proceeding through the hall several times and shooting toward and missing any students they saw, they went toward the west entrance and turned into the library hallway. Deputy Paul Smoker, a motorcycle patrolman for Jeffco Sheriff's Office, was writing a ticket north of the school when the, quote, female down call came at 11.23 a.m., Taking the shortest route, he drove his motorcycle over grass between the athletic fields and headed towards the west entrance. When he saw Deputy Scott Taborski following him in a patrol car, he abandoned his motorcycle for the safety of the car. The two deputies had begun to rescue two wounded students near the ball fields when another gunfight broke out at 11.26 a.m. as Harris returned to the double doors and again began shooting at Deputy Gardner, who returned fire. From the hilltop, Deputy Smoker fired three rounds from his pistol at Harris, who again retreated into the building. As before, no one was hit. Inside the school cafeteria, teacher Dave Sanders and two custodians, John Curtis and Jay Gallatine, initially told students to get under the tables, then successfully evacuated students up the staircase leading to the second floor of the school. The stairs were located around the corner from the library hallway in the main south hallway. Sanders then tried to secure as much of the school as he could. By now, Harris and Claybald were inside the main hallway. Sanders and another student were down at the end of the hallway where he gestured for students in the library to stay. They encountered Harris and Claybald, who were approaching them from the corner of the north hallway. Sanders and the student turned and ran in the opposite direction. Harris and Claybald shot at them both, with Harris hitting Sanders twice in the back and neck, but missing the student. The latter ran into a science classroom and warned everyone to hide. Claybald walked over toward Sanders, who had collapsed, and tossed a pipe bomb down the hall, then returned to Harris up the north hallway. Sanders struggled toward the science area, and a teacher took him into a classroom where 30 students were located. Due to his knowledge of first aid, student Aaron Hannessy was brought into the classroom from another by teachers despite the unfolding commotion. With the assistance of a fellow student named Kevin Starkey and a teacher, Teresa Miller, Hansey administered first aid to Sanders for three hours, attempting to stem the blood loss using shirts from students in the room and showing him pictures from his wallet to keep him talking. Using a phone in the room, Miller and several students maintained contact with the police from outside the school. Section 3.4, 11.29 a.m. to 11.36 a.m., Library Massacre. As the shooting unfolded, Patty Nielsen talked on the phone with emergency services, telling her story and urging students in the library to take cover beneath desks. 
According to transcripts, her call was received by a 911 operator at 11.25.18 a.m. 52 students, two teachers, and two librarians were in the library. Bombs were thrown into the cafeteria and library hallway. At 11.29 a.m., the gunmen entered the library. Harris fired his shotgun twice at a desk. Student Evan Todd had been standing near a pillar when the shooters entered the library and had just taken cover behind a copier. Todd was hit by wood splinters to the eye and lower back but was not seriously injured. He then hid behind the administrative counter. The shooters walked into the library towards the two rows of computers. Disabled student Kyle Velasquez was sitting at the north row. Claybold fired his shotgun at Velasquez, fatally hitting him in the head and back. The shooters put down their ammunition-filled duffel bags at the south, or a lower row of computers, and reloaded their weapons. They walked between the computer rows toward the windows facing the outside staircase. They, especially Claybold, began shouting and speaking to all the students in the library. Throughout the massacre in the library, they ordered everybody in the library to get up and said the library was going to explode from a bomb. They also stated they were getting revenge for what had been done to them the past year. They also stated how long they had been waiting for this and seemed to be enjoying themselves, shouting things like, Yahoo! after shooting. They repeatedly ordered the jocks to stand up. One of them said, Anybody with a white hat or a sports emblem on it is dead. Wearing a white baseball cap at Columbine was a tradition among sports team members. Nobody stood up, and several students tried to hide their white hats. Noticing that the police were evacuating students outside the school, they shot out the windows in the direction of the police. Officers returned fire, and the gunmen retreated from the windows. No one was injured. Claybold then removed his trench coat. He shouted for the jocks to stand up, and when no one did, he said, Fine, I'll just start shooting, and fired his shotgun at a nearby table, injuring three students, Patrick Ireland, Daniel Steepleton, and Mackay Hall. Harris walked toward the lower row of computer desks with his shotgun, firing a single shot under the first desk from a short distance away while down on one knee. He hit 14-year-old Stephen Kernow with a mortal wound to the neck. He then walked closer, got on one knee, and shot under the adjacent computer desk, injuring 17-year-old Casey Rugsager with a shot which passed completely through her right shoulder and hand, also grazing her neck and severing a major artery. When she started gasping in pain, Harris tersely stated, Quit your bitching. Harris walked over to the table across from the lower computer row, slapped the surface twice, and knelt, saying, Peekaboo! to 17-year-old Cassie Bernal before shooting her once in the head, killing her. Harris had been holding the shotgun with one hand at this point, and the weapon hit his face in recoil, breaking his nose. He told Claybold he had shot his nose, and Claybold responded, Why'd you do that? After fatally shooting Bernal, Harris turned toward the next table, where Bree Pasquale sat next to the table rather than under it. Harris's nose was bleeding heavily. Witnesses later reported that he seemed disoriented and had blood around his mouth. Harris asked Pasquale if she wanted to die, and she responded with a plea for her life. Harris laughed and responded, Everybody's gonna die. When Claybold said, Shoot her! Harris responded, No, we're gonna blow up the school anyway. Claybold noticed Ireland trying to provide aid to Hall, who had suffered a wound to his knee. As Ireland tried to help Hall, his head rose above the table. Claybold shot him a second time, hitting him twice in the head and once in the foot. Ireland was knocked unconscious, but survived. Claybold walked toward another table, where he discovered 18-year-old Isaiah Scholes, 16-year-old Matthew Kector, and 16-year-old Craig Scott, Rachel's younger brother, hiding underneath. Claybold called to Harris, There's a nigger over here! and tried to pull Scholes out from under the table. Harris left Pasquale and joined him. According to witnesses, they taunted Scholes for a few seconds, making derogatory racial comments. The gunmen both fired under the table. Harris shot Scholes once in the chest, killing him, 
and Klebold shot and killed Kector. Though Scholes was not shot in the head, Klebold said, I didn't know black brains could fly that far. Meanwhile, Scott was uninjured, laying in the blood of his friends, finding death. Harris then yelled, Who's ready to die next? He turned and threw a cricket at the table where Hall, Steepleton, and Ireland were located. It landed on Steepleton's thigh. Hall quickly tossed it behind them, and it exploded in midair. Harris walked toward the bookcases between the west and center section of tables in the library. He jumped on one and shook it, apparently attempting to topple it, then shot at the books which had fallen. Klebold walked to the east area of the library. Harris walked from the bookcase past the central area to meet Klebold. The latter shot at a display case next to the door, then turned and shot toward the closest table, hitting and injuring 17-year-old Mark Kinktigan in the head and shoulder. He then turned toward the table to his left and fired, injuring 18-year-old Lisa Krutz, Lauren Townsend, and Valine Schnurr with the same shotgun blast. Klebold then moved toward the same table and fired several shots with the Tech-9, killing Lauren Townsend. At this point, the seriously injured Valiant Schnurr began screaming, Oh my god! Oh my god! In response, Klebold asked Schnurr if she believed in the existence of God. When Schnurr replied she did, Klebold asked, Why? and commented, God is gay, before walking from the table. Harris approached another table where two girls were hiding. He bent down to look at them and dismissed them as pathetic. Harris then moved to another table where he fired twice, injuring 16-year-olds Nicole Nolan and John Tomlin. Tomlin moved out from under the table. Klebold shot him repeatedly, killing him. Harris then walked back over to the other side of the table where Townsend lay dead. Behind the table, a 16-year-old named Kelly Fleming had, like Brie Pasquale, sat next to the table rather than beneath it due to the lack of space. Harris shot Fleming with a shotgun, hitting her in the back and killing her. He shot at the table behind Fleming, hitting Townsend, who was already dead, and Kreutz again, and wounding 18-year-old Jenna Park. The shooters moved to the center of the library, where they reloaded their weapons at a table. Harris then pointed his carbine under a table, but the student he was aiming at moved out of the way. Harris turned his gun back on the student and told him to identify himself. It was John Savage, an acquaintance of Klebold's. He asked Klebold what they were doing, to which he shrugged and answered, Killing people? Savage asked if they were going to kill him. Possibly because of a fire alarm, Klebold said, What? Savage asked again whether they were going to kill him. Klebold said no and told him to run. Savage fled, escaping through the library's main entrance. After Savage left, Harris turned and fired his carbine at the table directly north of where he had been, hitting the ear and hand of 15-year-old Daniel Mauser. Mauser reacted by either shoving a chair at Harris or grabbing his leg. Harris fired again and hit Mauser in the center of the face at close range, killing him. Both shooters moved south and fired randomly under another table, critically injuring two 17-year-olds, Jennifer Doyle and Austin Eubanks, and fatally wounding 17-year-old Corey DePooter. He was the last to die in the massacre at 11.35 a.m. There were no further victims. They had killed 10 people in the library and wounded 12. Of the 56 library hostages, 34 remained unharmed. Investigators would later find that the shooters had enough ammunition to have killed them all. At this point, several witnesses later said they heard the shooters comment that they no longer found a thrill in shooting their victims. Klebold was quoted as saying, Maybe we should start knifing people. That might be more fun. They moved away from the table and went towards the library's main counter. Harris threw a Molotov cocktail toward the southwestern end of the library, but it failed to explode. Harris then went around the east side of the counter, and Claybold joined him from the west. They converged close to where Todd had moved after having been wounded. Claybold pulled out a chair, pointed his Tech-9 at Todd, and commented, Look what we have here. Harris seemed disoriented from his broken nose and asked, What? Claybold responded, Just some fat fuck. Todd was wearing a white hat. Claybold asked if he was a jock, 
And when Todd said no, Klebold responded, Well, that's good. We don't like jocks. Klebold then demanded to see his face. Todd partly lifted his hat so his face would remain obscured. When Klebold asked Todd to give him one reason why he should not kill him, Todd said, I don't want trouble. Klebold responded back angrily, Trouble? You don't even know what fucking trouble is. He also remarked, You used to call me a fag. Who's a fag now? Todd tried to correct himself. That's not what I meant. I mean, I don't have a problem with you guys. I never will, and I never did. Klebold then spoke to Harris. I'm going to let this fat fuck live. You can have Adam if you want to. Harris did not pay much attention and said, Let's go to the commons. Claybold turned and fired a single shot into an open library staff break room, hitting a small television. Before they left, Claybold slammed a chair down on top of a computer terminal and several books on the library counter, directly above the bureau where Patty Nielsen had hidden. The two walked out of the library at 11.36 a.m. Cautiously, fearing the shooter's return, 29 uninjured and 10 injured survivors began to evacuate the library through the north emergency exit door, which led to the sidewalk adjacent to the west entrance. Casey Rugsager was evacuated from the library by Craig Scott. Had she not been evacuated at this point, Rugsager would likely have bled to death from her injuries. Patrick Ireland, unconscious, and Lisa Krutz, unable to move, remained in the building. Patty Nielsen crawled into the exterior break room into which Claybold had fired shots and hid in a cupboard. Section 3.5, 12.08 p.m. Suicides. After leaving the library, the gunmen entered the science area where they caused a fire in an empty storage closet. It was extinguished by a teacher who had hidden in an adjacent room. The gunmen then proceeded toward the south hallway where they shot into an empty science room. At 11.44 a.m., they were captured on the school's security cameras as they re-entered the cafeteria. The recording shows Harris kneeling on the landing and firing a single shot towards one of the propane bombs left in the cafeteria in an unsuccessful attempt to detonate it. As Claybald approached the propane bomb and examined it, Harris took a drink from one of the cups left behind. Claybold lit a Molotov cocktail and threw it at the propane bomb. They left the cafeteria at 11.46 a.m., several seconds after the Molotov cocktail exploded. About a minute later, the gallon of fuel attached to the bomb ignited, causing a fire that was extinguished by the fire sprinklers. After leaving the cafeteria, they returned to the main, north and south hallways of the school, shooting aimlessly. They walked through the south hallway into the main office before returning to the north hallway. On several occasions, they looked through the windows of classroom doors, making eye contact with students hidden inside, but they never tried to enter any of the rooms. They taunted students hidden inside a bathroom, making such comments as, We know you're in there, and let's kill anyone we find in here, but never attempted to enter the bathroom. At 11.56 a.m., they returned to the cafeteria and briefly entered the school kitchen. They returned up the staircase and into the south hallway at 12 p.m. They re-entered the library, perhaps to watch their car bombs detonate, one of which had been set to explode at noon, and both of which failed. The library was empty of surviving students, except for the unconscious Patrick Ireland and the injured Lisa Krutz. Once inside, at 12.02 p.m., they shot through the west windows at police, who returned fire. Nobody was injured in the exchange. By 12.08 p.m., both gunmen had killed themselves. In a subsequent interview, Kreutz recalled hearing a comment such as, You, in the library, around this time. Harris sat down with his back to a bookshelf and fired his shotgun through the roof of his mouth. Claybald went down on his knees and shot himself in the left temple with his Tech-9. An article by the Rocky Mountain News stated that Patty Nielsen overheard them shout, One, two, three, in unison, just before a loud boom. Nielsen said that she had never spoken with either of the writers of that article, and evidence suggests otherwise. 
Just before shooting himself, Clayball had lit a Molotov cocktail on a nearby table, underneath which Patrick Ireland was laying, which caused the tabletop to momentarily catch fire. Underneath the scorched film of material was a piece of Harris's brain matter, suggesting Harris had shot himself by this point. In 2002, the National Enquirer posted two post-mortem photos of Harris and Claybald, showing both teenagers lying on their backs and the guns in seemingly curious locations. This led to speculation that Harris shot Claybold before killing himself. The photographs were taken after SWAT had checked the bodies for bombs and booby traps, and the placement of his blood and baseball cap suggest Claybold first fell down on Harris's legs before expiring on his back. A total of 188 rounds of ammunition were fired by the perpetrators during the massacre. Harris fired nearly twice as much as Claybald. He fired his carbine rifle a total of 96 times and discharged his shotgun 25 times. Claybald fired the Tech 9 handgun 55 times and 12 rounds from his double-barreled shotgun. Law enforcement officers fired 141 rounds during exchanges of gunfire with the shooters. Info box. Total deaths in order of sustaining fatal injuries. 1. Rachel Scott, 17 years old. 2. Daniel Rorbo, 15 years old. 3. William David Sanders, 47, a teacher. 4. Kyle Velasquez, 16 years old. 5. Stephen Kernow, 14 years old. 6. Cassie Bernal, 17 years old. 7. Isaiah Scholes, 18 years old. 8. Matthew Kechter, 16 years old. 9. Lauren Townsend, 18 years old. 10. John Tomlin, 16 years old. 11. Kelly Fleming, 16 years old. 12. Daniel Mauser, 15 years old. 13. Corey DePuter, 17 years old. 14. Eric Harris, 18 years old, perpetrator. 15. Dylan Claybald, 17 years old, perpetrator. Section 4. Crisis Ends. Section 4.1. SWAT Response. By noon, SWAT teams were stationed outside the school and ambulances started taking the wounded to local hospitals. A call for additional ammunition for police officers in case of a shootout came at 12.20 p.m. Authorities reported pipe bombs by 1 o'clock p.m. and two SWAT teams entered the school at 1.09 p.m., moving from classroom to classroom, discovering hidden students and faculty. They entered at the end of the school opposite the library, hampered by old maps and unaware a new wing had recently been added. They were also hampered by the sound of the fire alarms. Section 4.2, Leewood Elementary. Meanwhile, families of students and staff were asked to gather at nearby Leewood Elementary School to await information. All students, teachers, and school employees were taken away, questioned, and offered medical care in small holding areas before being bused to meet with their family members at Leewood Elementary. Some of the victims' families were told to wait on one final school bus that never came. Section 4.3, The Boy in the Window Patrick Ireland had regained and lost consciousness several times after being shot by Claybold. Paralyzed on his right side, he crawled to the library windows where, on live television, at 2.38 p.m., he stretched out the window, intending to fall into the arms of two SWAT team members standing on the roof of an emergency vehicle, but instead falling directly onto the vehicle's roof in a pool of blood. He became known as the boy in the window. They were later criticized for allowing Ireland to drop more than seven feet to the ground while doing nothing to try to ensure he could be lowered to the ground safely or break his fall. Lisa Krutz, shot in the shoulder, arms, hands, and thigh, remained laying in the library. She had tried to move but became lightheaded. Krutz kept track of time by the sound of the school's bells until police arrived. Section 4.4, One Bleeding to Death. At 2.15 p.m., students placed a sign in the window, 
one bleeding to death in order to alert police and medical personnel of Dave Sanders' location in the science room. Police initially feared it was a ruse by the shooters. A shirt was also tied to the doorknob. At 2.30 p.m., this was spotted, and by 2.40 p.m., SWAT officers evacuated the room of students and called for a paramedic. Hansi and Starkey were reluctant to leave Sanders behind. By 3 o'clock p.m., the SWAT officers had moved Sanders to a storage room, which was more easily accessible. As they did so, a paramedic arrived and found Sanders had no pulse. He had died of his injuries in the storage room before he could receive medical care. He was the only teacher to die in the shooting. Section 4.5, Suicide Mission, Estimated 25 Dead Kreutz was finally evacuated at 3.22 p.m., along with Patty Nielsen, Brian Anderson, and the three library staff who had hidden in the rooms adjacent to the library. Officials found the bodies in the library by 3.30 p.m. By 4 p.m., Sheriff Stone made an initial estimate of 25 dead students and teachers, 50 wounded, and referred to the massacre as a suicide mission. U.S. President Bill Clinton issued a statement. Section 4.6, Bomb Squad Response Stone said that police officers were searching the bodies of the gunmen. They feared they had used their pipe bombs to booby-trap corpses, including their own. At 4.30 p.m., the school was declared safe. At 5.30 p.m., additional officers were called in, as more explosives were found in the parking lot and on the roof. By 6.15 p.m., officials had found a bomb in Claybold's car in the parking lot, set to detonate the gas tank. Stone then marked the entire school as a crime scene. At 10.40 p.m., a member of the bomb squad, who was attempting to dispose of an undetonated pipe bomb, accidentally lit a striking match attached to the bomb by brushing it against the wall of the ordnance disposal trailer. The bomb detonated inside the trailer, but no one was injured. The bomb squad disrupted the car bomb. Claybold's car was repaired and in 2006 put up for auction. Section 5. Immediate Aftermath On the morning of April 21st, bomb squads combed the high school. By 8.30 a.m., the official death toll of 15 was released. The earlier estimate was 10 over the true death toll count, but close to the total count of wounded students. The total count of deaths was 12 students, 14 including the shooters, and one teacher. 20 students and one teacher were injured as the result of the shootings. Three more victims were injured indirectly as they tried to escape the school. It was then the worst school shooting in U.S. history. At 10 a.m., the bomb squad declared the building safe for officials to enter. By 11 a.m., a spokesman of the sheriff declared the investigation was underway. Thirteen of the bodies were still inside the high school as investigators photographed the building. At 2.30 p.m., a press conference was held by Jeffco District Attorney David Thomas and Sheriff John Stone, at which they said they suspected others had helped plan the shooting. Formal identification of the dead had not yet taken place, but families of the children thought to have been killed had been notified. Throughout the late afternoon and early evening, the bodies were gradually removed from the school and taken to the Jeffco Coroner's Office to be identified and autopsied. By 5 p.m., the names of many of the dead were known. An official statement was released naming the 15 confirmed deaths and the 27 injuries related to the massacre. On April 22nd, the cafeteria bombs were discovered. In the days following the shootings, Rachel Scott's car and John Tomlin's truck became memorials, and impromptu memorials were held in Clement Park. On April 30th, Carpenter Greg Zanis erected 15 six-feet-tall wooden crosses to honor those who had died at the school. Daniel Rohrbaugh's father cut down the two meant for the gunmen. There were also 15 trees planted, and he cut down two of those trees as well. Section 5.1 Search Warrant Press Conference Also on April 30th, high-ranking officials of Jeffco and the Jeffco Sheriff's Office met to decide if they should reveal that Michael Guerra had drafted an affidavit for a search warrant of Harris's residence more than a year before the shootings, based on his previous investigation of Harris's website and activities. Since the affidavit's contents lacked the necessary probable cause, they decided not to disclose this information at a press conference held on April 30th, nor did they mention it in any other way. 
Over the next two years, Guerra's original draft and investigative file documents were lost. In September of 1999, a Jeffco investigator failed to find the documents during a secret search of the county's computer system. A second attempt in late 2000 found copies of the document within the Jeffco archives. Their loss was termed troubling by a grand jury convened after the file's existence was reported in April of 2001. It was concealed by the Jeffco Sheriff's Office and not revealed until September 2001, resulting from an investigation by the TV show 60 Minutes. The documents were reconstructed and released to the public, but the original documents are still missing. The final grand jury investigation was released in September 2004. Section 5.2 Christian Martyrdom In the wake of the shooting, victims Rachel Scott and Cassie Bernal came to be regarded as Christian martyrs by evangelical Christians. Considerable media attention focused upon Bernal, who had been killed by Harris in the library, and who Harris was reported to have asked, Do you believe in God? immediately prior to her murder. Bernal was reported to have responded yes to this question before her murder. Emily Wyant, the closest living witness to Bernal's death, denied that Bernal and Harris had such an exchange. The closest living witness to Scott's death... Richard Castaldo once claimed Harris asked Scott if she believed in God and murdered her after she answered, You know I do. But this also appears to be untrue. Survivor Valine Schnur claims that she was the one questioned as to her belief in God. Joshua Lapp thought Bernal had been queried about her belief, but was unable to correctly point out where Bernal was located and was closer to Schnur during the shootings. Another witness, Craig Scott, claimed the discussion was with Bernal. When asked to indicate where the conversation had been coming from, he pointed to where Schnur was shot. Section 5.3 We Are Columbine In August 1999, students returned to the school, and Principal Frank DeAngelis led a rally of students clad in We Are Columbine shirts. Section 5.4 Additional Related Deaths Several former students and teachers suffer from PTSD. Six months after the shootings, Anne Mary Hockhalter's mother killed herself. Greg Barnes, a student who witnessed Sanders get shot, committed suicide in May 2000. In 2019, survivor Austin Eubanks died. He was injured during the shooting and heavily medicated, leading to an opioid addiction that he overcame and later spoke publicly about. He was 37. Section 6. Rationale. The shooting was planned as a terrorist attack that would cause the most deaths in U.S. history, but the motive has never been ascertained with any degree of certainty. Soon after the massacre, it was thought Harris and Claybold targeted jocks, blacks, and Christians. Both sought to provide answers in the journals and videotapes, but investigators found them lacking. In a letter provided with the May 15th report on the Columbine attack, Sheriff John Stone and Under Sheriff John A. Dunaway wrote they cannot answer the most fundamental question, why? Section 6.1, FBI's Theory, Psychopath and Depressive The FBI concluded that the killers were victims of mental illness, that Harris was a clinical psychopath, and Claybold was depressive. Dr. Duane Fusilier, the supervisor in charge of the Columbine investigation, would later remark, I believe Eric went to the school to kill and didn't care if he died, while Dylan wanted to die and didn't care if others died as well. In April 1998, a year before the shooting, Harris wrote a letter of apology to the owner of the van as part of his diversion program. Around the same time, he derided him in his journal, stating that he believed himself to have the right to steal something if he wanted to. By far, the most prevalent theme in Claybold's journals is his private despair at his lack of success with women, which he refers to as an infinite sadness. Claybold had repeatedly documented his desires to kill himself, and his final remark in the basement tapes, shortly before the attack, is a resigned statement made as he glances away from the camera. Just know I'm going to a better place. I didn't like life too much. According to this theory, used by Dave Cullen for his 2009 book Columbine, Harris had been the mastermind. He had a messianic-level superiority complex and hoped to demonstrate his superiority to the world. Claybold was a follower who primarily participated in the massacre as a means to simply end his life. 
There have been other attempts to diagnose Harris and Claybold with mental illness. Peter Langman believes Harris was a psychopath and Claybold was schizotypal. Professor Aubrey Immelman published a personality profile of Harris based on journal entries and personal communication and believes the material suggested behavior patterns consistent with a malignant narcissism, pathological narcissistic personality disorder with borderline and antisocial features, along with some paranoid traits and unconstrained aggression. Section 6.2 Other Factors The FBI's theory has been met with criticism. For instance, Claybold, not Harris, was the first to mention a killing spree in his journal, and there is evidence to suggest that both students were depressed, such as Harris being prescribed antidepressants. Section 6.2.1 Bullying The link between bullying and school violence has attracted increasing attention since the massacre. Both of the shooters were classified as gifted children who had allegedly been victims of bullying for years. Early stories following the shootings charged that school administrators and teachers at Columbine had long condoned bullying. Critics said this could have been contributed to triggering the perpetrator's extreme violence. Claybold said on the basement tapes, You've been giving us shit for years. Accounts from various parents and school staffers described bullying at the school as rampant. Nathan Vanderow, a friend of Claybold, and Alyssa Owen, Harris's 8th grade science partner, reported that Harris and Claybold were constantly picked on. Vanderow noted that a cup of fecal matter was thrown at them. Reportedly, they were regularly called faggot. Claybold is known to have remarked to his father of his hatred of the jocks at CHS, adding that Harris in particular had been victimized. Claybold had stated, they sure give Eric hell. Classmate Chad Laughlin stated, A lot of the tension in the school came from the class above us. There were people fearful of walking by a table where you knew you didn't belong. Stuff like that. Certain groups certainly got preferential treatment across the board. Brown also noted Harris was born with a mild chest indent. This made him reluctant to take his shirt off in gym class, and other students would laugh at him. A year after the massacre, an analysis by officials at the U.S. Secret Service of 37 premeditated school shootings found that bullying, which some of the shooters described in terms that approached torment, played the major role in more than two-thirds of the attacks. A similar theory was expounded by Brooks Brown in his book on the massacre, No Easy Answers. He noted that teachers commonly ignored bullying and that whenever Harris and Claybold were bullied by the jocks at CHS, they would make statements such as, Don't worry, man. It happens all the time. During junior year, Harris and Claybold both had been confronted by a group of students at CHS, all members of the football team, who sprayed them with ketchup and mustard while referring to them as faggots and queers. According to Brown, People surrounded them in the commons and squirted ketchup packets all over them, laughing at them, calling them faggots. That happened while teachers watched. They couldn't fight back. They wore the ketchup all day and went home covered with it. Laughlin stated, I caught the tail end of one really horrible incident, and I know Dylan told his mother that it was the worst day of his life. According to Laughlin, it involved seniors pelting Claybold with ketchup-covered tampons in the commons. Dave Cullen disputes the theory of revenge for bullying as a motivation. While acknowledging the pervasiveness of bullying in high schools, including CHS, he had claimed they were not victims of bullying. He said Harris was more often the perpetrator than victim of bullying. In a fact check published on April 19, 2019, on the eve of the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the massacre, Gillian Brockel in the Washington Post underscored that, contrary to the popular view, their attack was not revenge for being bullied. Section 6.2.2 Social Isolation During and after the initial investigations, social cliques within high schools such as the Trenchcoat Mafia were widely discussed. One perception formed was that Harris and Claybold were both outcasts who had been isolated from their classmates, prompting feelings of helplessness, insecurity, and depression, as well as a strong need for attention. This concept has been questioned as both Harris and Claybold had a close circle of friends and a wider informal social group. Cohen and Brock L. both also say they were not in the trench coat mafia and were not isolated outcasts or loners. Harris's last journal entry reads, 
I hate you people for leaving me out of so many fun things. The Lonely Man Strikes with Absolute Rage, wrote Claybold. In an interview, Brown described them as the school's worst outcasts, the losers of the losers. 6.2.3 Political Terrorism Sociologist Ralph Larkin has theorized the massacre was to trigger a revolution of outcast students and the dispossessed as an overtly political act in the name of oppressed students victimized by their peers. The Columbine shootings redefine such acts not merely as revenge but as a means of protest of bullying, intimidation, social isolation, and public rituals of humiliation. One author argues Columbine was only increasingly linked to terrorism after the September 11th attacks. On the basement tapes, Harris claimed they would kickstart a revolution. Klebold wore a Soviet Union pin on his boots during the massacre. The attack occurred on April 20th, Adolf Hitler's birthday, which led to media speculation that the attack was political. Some people, such as Robin Anderson, stated that the pair was not obsessed with National Socialism and that they did not worship or admire Hitler in any way. In retrospect, Anderson stated that there were many things that the pair did not tell friends. Harris at least did revere the Nazis and often praised them in his journal. Harris was enrolled in German class. Claybold and Harris may have originally selected April 19th, the date of the Oklahoma City bombing, as the date for the massacre, but the attack occurred on April 20th. Harris needed more ammunition for Mark Maines, for which one had to be 21 years old to get from Kmart, and Maines did not get it for him until the evening of the 19th. Maines asked if Harris was going shooting that night. Harris replied he would tomorrow. In 2001, Kmart announced it would no longer sell handgun ammunition. Section 6.2.4, Medication. In one scheduled meeting with his appointed psychiatrist, Harris had complained of depression, anger, and suicidal thoughts. He was prescribed Zoloft. He complained of feeling restless and having trouble concentrating. His doctor switched him to Luvox, a similar selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Toxicology reports confirmed that Harris had the antidepressant Luvox in his bloodstream at the time of the shootings. Claybolt had no medications in his system. Opponents of contemporary psychiatry like Peter Bregan claim that the psychiatric medications prescribed to Harris may have exacerbated his aggressiveness. Harris wanted to join the United States Marine Corps. His application to the Marines was rejected shortly before the shootings because he had taken Luvox. According to the recruiting officer, Harris did not know about this rejection, but Brooks Brown said that he did. Section 6.2.5 Music Blame for the shootings was also directed at other metal or dark music bands. Section 6.2.5.1 Marilyn Manson In the late 1990s, Marilyn Manson and his eponymous band established themselves as a household name and as one of the most controversial rock acts in music history. Their two albums prior to the massacre were both critical and commercial successes and by the time of their Rock is Dead tour in 1999, the frontman had become a culture war iconoclast and a rallying icon for alienated youth. As their popularity increased, the confrontational nature of the group's music and imagery outraged social conservatives. Numerous politicians lobbied to have their performances banned, citing false and exaggerated claims that they contained animal sacrifices, bestiality, and rape. Their concerts were routinely picketed by religious advocates and parent groups who asserted that their music had a corrupting influence on youth culture by inciting rape, murder, blasphemy, and suicide. Immediately after the massacre, a majority of blame was directed at the band and specifically on its outspoken frontman. In the weeks following the shootings, media reports about Harris and Claybald portrayed them and the Trenchcoat Mafia as part of a gothic cult. Early media reports alleged that the shooters were fans and were wearing the group's t-shirts during the massacre. Although these claims were later proven to be false, news outlets continued to run sensationalist stories with headlines such as Killers Worshipped Rock Freak Manson and Devil Worshipping Maniac Told Kids to Kill. Speculation in national media and among the public led many to believe that Manson's music and imagery were the shooter's sole motivation despite reports that revealed that the two were not big fans. Infobox 
I think there's something going on that you can't see from the outside. His whole thing was part of a drug cultural type thing with a subculture of violence and killing and hatred and anti-family values, anti-traditional values, anti-authority. We're having an alarming rate of killings in schools and youth violence and an increase in drugs. I would say that, though they're not all to be blamed on a shock entertainer like Marilyn Manson, I think he promotes it and can be part of the blame. Michigan State Senator Dale Sugar's concerns on the influence of Marilyn Manson on his teenage fans. Despite this, Marilyn Manson were widely criticized by religious, political, and entertainment industry figures. Under mounting pressure, in the days after Columbine, the group postponed their last five North American tour dates out of respect for victims and their families. On April 29th, 10 U.S. Senators, led by Sam Brownback of Kansas, sent a letter to Edgar Bronfman Jr., the president of Seagram, the owner of Interscope, requesting a voluntary halt to his company's distribution to children of, quote, music that glorifies violence. The letter named Marilyn Manson for producing songs which, quote, eerily reflect the actions of Harrison Claybald. Later that day, the band canceled their remaining North American shows. Two days later, Manson published his response to these accusations in an op-ed piece for the Rolling Stone titled, Columbine, Whose Fault Is It?, where he castigated America's gun culture, the political influence of the National Rifle Association, and the media's irresponsible coverage, which he said facilitated the placing of blame on a scapegoat instead of debating more relevant societal issues. On May 4th, a hearing on the marketing and distribution of violent content to minors by the television, music, film, and video game industries was held by the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. The committee heard testimony from former Secretary of Education and co-founder of conservative, violent entertainment watchdog group Empower America, William Bennett, the Archbishop of Denver, Charles J. Shapit, professors and mental health professionals. Speakers criticized the band and its label mate Nine Inch Nails for their alleged contribution to a cultural environment enabling violence such as the Columbine shootings. The committee requested that the Federal Trade Commission and the United States Department of Justice investigate the entertainment industry's marketing practices to minors. After concluding the European and Japanese legs of their tour on August 8th, the band withdrew from public view to their next album, 2000's Hollywood in the Shadow of the Valley of Death, as an artistic rebuttal to the allegations leveled against them. Manson appeared on an April 2001 episode of The O'Reilly Factor, where he once again denied that the band's music was responsible for Columbine. Bill O'Reilly argued that disturbed kids without direction from responsible parents would misinterpret the message of his music as endorsing the belief that, quote, when I'm dead, then everybody's going to know me. Manson responded, quote, well, I think that's a very valid point, and I think that's a reflection of, not necessarily this program, but of television in general, that if you die and enough people are watching you become a martyr, you become a hero, you become well-known. So when you have these things like Columbine, and you have these kids who are angry and they have something to say and no one's listening, the media sends a message that says, if you do something loud enough and it gets our attention, then you will be famous for it. These kids ended up on the cover of Time magazine twice. The media gave them exactly what they wanted. That's why I never did any interviews around that time when I was being blamed for it, because I didn't want to contribute to something that I found to be reprehensible. End quote. During the supporting tour for Hollywood, Manson appeared in Michael Moore's 2002 documentary Bowling for Columbine. His appearance was filmed during the band's first show in Denver since the shooting. When Moore asked Manson what he would have said to the students at Columbine, he replied, I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say, and that's what no one did. Section 6.2.5.2 KMFDM and Rammstein Harris and Claybold were both fans of the German rock bands KMFDM and Rammstein. Harris's website contained lyrics from both artists, such as KMFDM's Son of a Gun, Stray Bullet, and Waste, as well as translations for the songs done in German. In the same blog post which threatened Brown, Harris wrote, I'll just go to some downtown area and blow up and shoot everything I can, feel no remorse, no sense of shame. The last sentence is a quote from KMFDM's song, Anarchy. 
As above, Claybald wrote in Harris's yearbook, My wrath for January's incident will be godlike, and he wore a shirt saying wrath during the massacre. Wrath and Godlike are songs by KMFDM. On April 20th, 1999, KMFDM released the album Adios. Harris noted the coincidence of the album's title and release date in his journal as a, quote, subliminal final adios tribute to Reb and Vodka. Thanks, KMFDM. I ripped the hell out of the system. He quotes Godlike. KMFDM's frontman, Sasha Konitsko, responded to the controversy with a statement, quote, First and foremost, KMFDM would like to express their deep and heartfelt sympathy for the parents, families, and members of the murdered and injured children in Littleton. We are sick and appalled, as is the rest of the nation, by what took place in Colorado yesterday. KMFDM are an art form, not a political party. From the beginning, our music has been a statement against war, oppression, fascism, and violence against others. While some of the former band members are German, as reported in the media, none of us condone any Nazi beliefs whatsoever. Section 6.2.6 .6, Film Parents of some of the victims filed several unsuccessful lawsuits against film companies over films such as The Basketball Diaries, which includes a dream sequence with a student shooting his classmates in a trench coat. In the basement tapes, the debate on whether or not Steven Spielberg or Quentin Tarantino are appropriate choices to direct films about the massacre. Their home videos also show inspiration taken from Pulp Fiction. Both were fans of the film Lost Highway. Apocalypse Now was found in Harris's VCR. Section 6.2.6.1 .6 Natural Born Killers See also Natural Born Killers Copycat Crimes they were avid fans of the movie Natural Born Killers and used the film's acronym NBK as a code for the massacre. In February 1998, Claybold envisioned a massacre with a girl like in the film, writing, Soon, either I'll commit suicide, or I'll get W, redacted girl's name, and it will be NBK for us. In April 1998, Harris wrote, When I go NBK and people say things like, Oh, it was tragic, or Oh, he is crazy, or It was so bloody, I think, So the fuck what you think, that's a bad thing. In Harris's yearbook, Claybold wrote, The holy April morning of NBK. Around February 1999, he wrote, Maybe going NBK, God, with Eric is the way to break free. In Harris's last journal entry, he wrote, Everything I see and I hear, I incorporate into NBK somehow. Feels like a goddamn movie sometimes. Section 6.2.7, .6 Video Games. Violent video games were also blamed. Parents of some of the victims filed several unsuccessful lawsuits against video game manufacturers. Gerald Block believes their immersion in a virtual world best explains the massacre. Harris and Claybold were both fans of shooter video games such as Doom, Quake, Duke Nukem 3D, and Postal. Harris wrote the massacre will be like the LA riots, the Oklahoma bombing, World War II, Vietnam, Duke, and Doom all mixed together. In his last journal entry, Harris wished to get a few extra frags on the scoreboard. Section 6.2.7.1 .6 Doom. See also Doom 1993 video game controversies. They were avid fans of Doom especially. Harris said of the massacre, It's going to be like fucking Doom. He also wrote, I must not be sidetracked by my feelings of sympathy, so I will force myself to believe that everyone is just another monster from Doom. In Harris's yearbook, Claybold wrote, I find a similarity between people and Doom zombies. Harris named his shotgun Arlene after a character in the Doom novels. Harris said the shotgun was straight out of Doom. The Tech-9 Claybold used resembled an AB-10, a weapon from the Doom novels that Harris referenced several times. After the massacre, rumors circulated that Harris created Doom levels resembling CHS, but the alleged levels were never found. Harris spent a great deal of time creating a large WAD named Tear, the German for animal, and a song by Rammstein, calling it his life's work. The WAD was uploaded to the Columbine School computer and to AOL shortly before the attack, but appears to have been lost. Infobox 
They are able to hook into the internet and play video games that are extraordinarily violent, that cause the blood pressure to rise and the adrenaline level to go up. Games that cause people to be killed and the players to die themselves. It is a very intense experience. They are able to get into internet chat rooms and, if there are no nuts or people of the same mentality in their hometown, hook up with people around the country. They are able to rent from the video store, not just go down and see Natural Born Killers or the Basketball Diaries, but they're able to bring it home and watch it repeatedly. In this case, even maybe make their own violent film. Many have said this murder was very much akin to the Basketball Diaries, in which a student goes in and shoots others in the classroom. I have seen a video of that, and many others have. In music, there is Marilyn Manson, an individual who chooses the name of a mass murderer as part of his name. The lyrics of his music are consistent with his choice of name. They are violent and nihilistic, and there are groups all over the world who do this, some German groups and others. I guess what I am saying is, a person already troubled in this modern high-tech world can be in their car and hear the music. They can be in their room and see the video. They can go into the chat rooms and act out these video games and even take it to real life. Something there is very much of a problem. Chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Youth Violence, Senator Jeff Sessions, testifying before the Senate on the Columbine Tragedy, 1999. Section 7. Perpetrators. 7.1. Eric Harris. Eric David Harris, April 9, 1981 through April 20, 1999, was born in Wichita, Kansas. The Harris family relocated often, as Harris's father was a U.S. Air Force transport pilot. His mother was a homemaker. The family moved from Plattsburgh, New York, to Littleton, Colorado in July 1993, when his father retired from military service. The Harris family lived in rented accommodations for the first three years that they lived in the Littleton area. During this time, he attended Ken Carroll Middle School and Harris met Claybold. In 1996, the Harris family purchased a house south of CHS. His older brother attended college at the University of Colorado Boulder. Section 7.2, Dylan Claybold. Dylan Bennett Claybold, September 11, 1981 through April 20, 1999, was born in Lakewood, Colorado. His parents were pacifists and attended a Lutheran church with their children. Both Dylan and his older brother attended confirmation classes in accordance with the Lutheran tradition. As had been the case with his older brother, Claybold was named after a renowned poet, in his case the playwright Dylan Thomas. At the family home, the Claybolds also observed some rituals in keeping with Claybold's maternal grandfather's Jewish heritage. Claybold attended Normandy Elementary in Littleton, Colorado for the first two grades before transferring to Governor's Ranch Elementary and became part of the CHIPS Challenging High Intellectual Potential Students program. He found the transition to Ken Carroll Middle School difficult. Unlike the white caps of the jocks, Harris and Claybold wore black baseball caps. As was typical in the 1990s, they wore them backwards. Harris wore a KM FDM cap and apparently did not wear it during the massacre. Claybold's cap had a Colorado Avalanche logo on the front and a Boston Red Sox logo sewn into the back. Section 8. Legacy Following the Columbine shooting, schools across the United States instituted new security measures such as see-through backpacks, metal detectors, school uniforms, and security guards. Some schools implemented the numbering of school doors in order to improve public safety response. Several schools throughout the country resorted to requiring students to wear computer-generated IDs. Schools also adopted a zero-tolerance approach to possession of weapons and threatening behavior by students. Despite the effort, several social science experts feel the zero-tolerance approach adopted in schools has been implemented too harshly with unintended consequences creating other problems. Despite the safety measures that were implemented in the wake of the tragedy at Columbine, school shootings continued to take place in the United States at an alarming rate. Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, and Stoneman Douglas were three subsequent school shootings that far eclipsed the terror that took place at Columbine. Some schools renewed existing anti-bullying policies. Rachel's Challenge was started by Rachel Scott's parents, 
and lectures schools about bullying and suicide. Section 8.1, Police Tactics. Police departments reassess their tactics and now train for Columbine-like situations after criticism over the slow response and progress of the SWAT teams during the shooting. Sheriff Stone did not seek re-election. Police followed a traditional tactic at Columbine, surround the building, set up a perimeter, and contain the damage. That approach has been replaced by a tactic known as the Immediate Action Rapid Deployment Tactic. This tactic calls for a four-person team to advance into the site of any ongoing shooting, optimally a diamond-shaped wedge, but even with just a single officer if more are not available. Police officers using this tactic are trained to move toward the sound of gunfire and neutralize the shooter as quickly as possible. Their goal is to stop the shooter at all costs. They are to walk past wounded victims as the aim is to prevent the shooter from killing or wounding more. Dave Cullen has stated, The active protocol has proved successful at numerous shootings. At Virginia Tech alone, it probably saved dozens of lives. Section 8.2 Lawsuits. After the massacre, many survivors and relatives of deceased victims filed lawsuits. Under Colorado state law at the time, the maximum a family could receive in a lawsuit against a government agency was $600,000. Most cases against the Jeffco Police Department and School District were dismissed by the federal court on the grounds of government immunity. The case against the sheriff's office regarding the death of Dave Sanders was not dismissed due to the police preventing paramedics from going to his aid for hours after they knew the gunmen were dead. The case was settled out of court in August 2002 for $1,500,000. In April 2001, the families of more than 30 victims received a $2,538,000 settlement in their case against the families of Harris, Claybald, Maines, and Duran. Under the terms of the settlement, the Harrises and the Claybolds contributed $1,568,000 through their homeowners' policies, with another $32,000 set aside for future claims. The Mains contributed $720,000 and another $80,000 set aside for future claims, and the Durans contributed $250,000 with an additional $50,000 available for future claims. The family of the victim, Scholes, rejected this settlement, but in June 2003 were ordered by a judge to accept the $366,000 settlement in their $250 million lawsuit against the shooter's families. In August 2003, the families of victims Fleming, Kechter, Rohrbaugh, Townsend, and Velasquez received undisclosed settlements in a wrongful death lawsuit against the Harrises and Claybolds. Section 8.3, Memorials. Many impromptu memorials were created after the massacre, including victims Rachel Scott's car and John Tomlin's truck. In 2000, youth advocate Melissa Helmbrecht organized a remembrance event in Denver featuring two surviving students called A Call to Hope. The library where most of the massacre took place was removed and replaced with an atrium. In 2001, a new library, the Hope Memorial Library, was built next to the west entrance. On Friday the 26th of 2004, thousands of pieces of evidence from the massacre were put on display at the Jeffco Fairgrounds in Golden. A permanent memorial began planning in June 1999. A permanent memorial, quote, to honor and remember the victims of the April 20th, 1999 shootings at Columbine High School, end quote, began planning in June 1999 and was dedicated on September 21, 2007 in Clement Park. The memorial fund raised $1.5 million in donations over eight years of planning. Designing took three and a half years and included feedback from victims' families, survivors, the high school's students and staff, and the community. Section 8.4, Gun Control. The shooting resulted in calls for more gun control measures. The gun show loophole and background checks became a focus of a national debate. It was the deadliest mass shooting during the era of the federal assault weapons ban. Victim Daniel Mauser's father, Tom Mauser, has become a gun control advocate. In 2000, federal and state legislation was introduced that would require safety locks on all firearms, as well as ban the importation of high-capacity ammunition magazines. 
Though laws were passed that made it a crime to buy guns for criminals and minors, there was considerable controversy over legislation pertaining to background checks at gun shows. There was concern in the gun lobby over restrictions on Second Amendment rights in the United States. Frank Lautenberg introduced a proposal to close the gun show loophole in federal law. It was passed in the Senate, but did not pass in the House. Michael Moore's 2002 documentary Bowling for Columbine focused heavily on the American obsessions with handguns, its grip on Jeffco, and its role in the shooting. Section 8.5, Popular Culture. Columbine has since become a euphemism for a school shooting, rather like going postal is for workplace violence. A video game called Super Columbine Massacre RPG was based on the massacre. The 2016 biographical film I'm Not Ashamed, based on the journals of Rachel Scott, includes glimpses of Harris's and Claybold's lives and interactions with other students at CHS. The 1999 black comedy Duck, the Carbine High Massacre, is inspired by the Columbine Massacre. The 2003 Gus Van Sant film Elephant depicts a fictional school shooting, but is based in part on the Columbine Massacre. The 2003 Ben Coccio film Zero Day was also based on the massacre. The first documentary on the massacre may have been the TLC documentary Lost Boys in 2000. The 2002 Michael Moore documentary film Bowling for Columbine won several awards. Also, in 2002, A&E made Columbine, Understanding Why. In 2004, the shooting was dramatized in the documentary Zero Hour. In 2007, the massacre was documented in an episode of the National Geographic Channel documentary series The Final Report. The 2009 film April Showers, which was written and directed by Andrew Robinson, who was a senior at CHS during the shooting, was based on Columbine. The 2013 film Kids for Cash, about the Kids for Cash scandal, detail it as part of the zero tolerance policy in the wake of the Columbine shootings. Columbine students Jonathan and Stephen Cohen wrote a song called Friend of Mine, Columbine, which briefly received airplay in the U.S. after being performed at a memorial service broadcast on nationwide television. The song was pressed to CD with the proceeds benefiting families affected by the massacre, and over 10,000 copies were ordered. Shortly following the release of the CD single, the song was also featured on the Lullaby for Columbine CD. Since the advent of online social media, a fandom for shooters Harrison Claybold has had a documented presence on social media sites, especially Tumblr. Fans of Harrison Claybold refer to themselves as Columbiners. An article published in 2015 in the Journal of Transformative Works, a scholarly journal which focuses on the sociology of fandoms, noted that Columbiners were not fundamentally functionally different from more mainstream fandoms. Columbiners create fan art and fan fiction, even cosplay in the pair, and have a scholarly interest in the shooting. 8.6. Copycats. The Columbine shootings influenced subsequent school shootings, with several such plots mentioning it. Fear of copycats has sometimes led to the closing of entire school districts. Since Columbine, over 74 copycat cases have been reported, 21 of which resulted in attacks, while the rest were thwarted by law enforcement. In many of them, the perpetrators cited Harris and Claybold as heroes or martyrs. Harris and Claybold have become what the Napa Valley Register have called cultural icons for troubled youth. According to psychiatrist E. Fuller Torrey of the Treatment Advocacy Center, a legacy of the Columbine shootings is its allure to disaffected youth. Rolf Larkin examined 12 major school shootings in the U.S. in the following eight years and found that in eight of those, the shooters made explicit reference to Harrison Claybold. Larkin wrote that the Columbine Massacre established a script for shootings. Numerous post-Columbine rampage shooters referred directly to Columbine as their inspiration. Others attempted to superside the Columbine shootings in body count. A 2015 investigation by CNN identified more than 40 people, charged with Columbine-style plots. A 2014 investigation by ABC News identified at least 17 attacks and another 36 alleged plots or serious threats against schools since the assault on Columbine High School that can be tied to the 1999 massacre. Ties identified by ABC News included online research by the perpetrators into the Columbine shooting, clip-in news coverage and images of Columbine, Explicit statements of admiration of Harris and Claybold, such as writings in journals and on social media, and video posts, 
and in police interviews, timing plan to an anniversary of Columbine, plans to exceed the Columbine victim counts, and other ties. In 2015, journalist Malcolm Gladwell, writing in the New Yorker magazine, proposed a threshold model of school shootings in which Harris and Claybold were the triggering actors in a slow-motion, ever-evolving riot in which each new participant's action makes sense in reaction to and in combination with those who came before. The first copycat may have been the W.R. Myers high school shooting just eight days after Columbine when a 14-year-old Canadian student went into his school at lunchtime with a sawed-off 22 rifle under his dark blue trench coat and opened fire, killing one student. A month after the massacre, Heritage High School in Conyers, Georgia had a shooting which Attorney General Janet Reno called a Columbine copycat. A friend of Harrison Claybold, Eric Vake, was arrested after threatening to finish the job at CHS in October 1999. In 2001, Charles Andrew Williams, the Santana High School shooter, reportedly told his friends that he was going to pull a Columbine, though none of them took him seriously and played it off as a joke. In 2005, Jeff Weiss, an American Indian who wore a trench coat, killed his grandfather, who was a police officer, and his girlfriend. He took his grandfather's weapon on his squad car and drove to his former high school in Red Lake and murdered several students before killing himself. In an apparent reference to Columbine, he asked one student if they believed in God. The perpetrator of the Dawson College shooting wrote a note praising Harrison Claybold. Convicted students Brian Draper and Tori Adamchick of Pocatello High School in Idaho, who murdered their classmate Cassie Jo Stoddart, mentioned Harrison Claybold in their homemade videos and were reportedly planning a Columbine-like shooting. The perpetrator of the Emsdetton school shooting praised Harris in his diary. In November 2007, Pekka Eric Alvinen imitated Columbine with a shooting in Jokola in Tusla, Finland. He wore a shirt which said, Humanity is overrated, and attempted to start a fire inside the school but failed. In December 2007, A man killed two at a Youth with a Mission Center in Arvada, Colorado, and another two at the New Life Church in Colorado Springs before killing himself. He quoted Harris prior to the attack under the heading, Christianity is your Columbine. In a self-made video recording sent to the news media by Swung Hee Cho prior to his committing the Virginia Tech shootings, he referred to the Columbine massacre as an apparent motivation. In the recording, he wore a backwards baseball cap and referred to Harris and Claybold as martyrs. Adam Lanza, the perpetrator of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, had an obsession with mass murders, in particular the April 1999 shootings at Columbine High School in Colorado. The Tumblr fandom gained widespread media attention in February 2015 after three of its members conspired to commit a mass shooting at a Halifax mall on Valentine's Day. In 2017, two 15-year-old schoolboys from North Allerton in England were charged with conspiracy to murder after becoming infatuated with the crime and hero-worshipping Harrison Claybold. The Santa Fe high school shooting, in which 10 people were killed, strongly resembled the Columbine massacre. The perpetrator, Dimitrios Pegortzis, used a pump-action shotgun and homemade explosives, wore similar clothing as Harrison Claybold, including a black trench coat and combat boots, and reportedly yelled, surprise, to a victim during the shooting, a possible reference to the library massacre at Columbine. The Kirch Polytechnic College massacre appears to be a copycat crime. The shooter wore a white shirt which said hatred in Russian, one fingerless glove, planted bombs, and committed suicide with a shotgun in the library. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 Unported License, available at creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by hyphen SA slash 3.0.